Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Jane Smiley in conversation with Barbara Lane. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started this evening. Uh, we will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, details for purchasing tonight's title, as well as previous titles by Jane, and we'll also include my contact details for post-event information. And Jane has so kindly sent in signed book plates for us, which will be available through our Petaluma and Montgomery Village store, but we'll touch on that later in the program, so don't worry about it yet. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments for the speakers. The event will feature between 30 to 45 minutes of in-conversation and will then be followed by a live Q&A. Please, uh, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. Much appreciated. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce tonight's author, Jane Smiley. Jane is the author of numerous novels, including A Thousand Acres, which, is, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, and most recently, The Last Hundred Years Trilogy, Some Luck, Early Warning, and Golden Age. She is also the author of several works of nonfiction and books for young adults. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, she has also received the Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Award for Literature, and she lives in Northern California. In conversation with her tonight is our very own Barbara Lane. Barbara is the books columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, and she is the director of events here at Copperfield's Books. So tonight, they are with us to discuss Jane's new title, Perestroika in Paris. So I'm going to hand it all over to you, Barbara. I know everyone's excited, and thanks for bearing with us with the scheduling change. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Jamie, and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And again, going with the schedule change, I think most people would agree that that was a good idea. It was kind of crazy on January 7th. And yeah. um, we're just so pleased to have Jane here tonight, of course, and pleased to talk about her new book, Perestroika in Paris. And I just wanna say at the outset, this has been a challenging time. I thank you, Jane. <laughs> Good demo. I think we all <laughs> acknowledge this has been a challenging time. I could say that a hundred more times, but I'll stop. You all get it. This book is the antidote to what we've been going through for the last year. I, I can't stop saying the word charming because it's charming um, in the very best way in a touching way, in a gentle way, in a way that makes you smile and just happy to be reading it. So Jane, well, before I get to my first question, I have to tell you that Jane confided in me that she is wearing the first cable sweater <laughs> to knit tonight. <laughs> Let me just show the pattern because it's intricate and so cool. And she did that herself. And I know that I'm impressed because- That's the pattern. Fabulous. It was Fabulous. kind of a head scratcher. I, I haven't done cables before. I've knitted a lot of sweaters, but it, well, it's, thank you. it's more time. It's more time consuming, but I like I like what it came out to be. Well, thank you for debuting it with us. Thank you. We're, we're very pleased to do it. it. So you, this book, uh, Paris in Perestroika, centers on uh, Perestroika in Paris. Sorry, centers on a horse named Perestroika and. Um, you and horses have a long history. Mm -hmm. You've written a number of books about horses, some for adults, A Day at the Races and Horse Heaven, and then two five-part series for young adults, the Ellen and Ned series and the Horses of Oak Valley Ranch. So tell us about horses in your life and when you got your first horse and where this all began. Well, I know exactly where it began, other than television. You know, when my mom got us television, there were a lot of cowboy shows on, and I and we saw the horses, and that was probably my first introduction. But um, when I was growing up in St. Louis, we lived in a, a, a town called Webster Groves outside of St. Louis. And because my mother worked for the local newspaper as the women's page editor, 
I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And I think it was in kindergarten, um, somebody set up a pony ride on the corner about halfway between my grandparents' house and my mom's apartment. And it was wonderful. And they would do this at night too. So you would, you'd stop there and they would bring out one of the ponies and they'd strap you into the saddle, which was a Western saddle. And then they would send the pony at the trot around the maze, maybe three or four times. And I, I just adored it. And it actually was a good way to learn because you were strapped in so you couldn't fall out. You were trotting so you got used to the, what's actually the hardest gait. And the ponies were very sweet. And so the, I was just won me over. And I was just crazy for horses, crazy for horses. And then my mom, when I was about in, at the beginning of sixth grade, my mom remarried and they let me take riding lessons. There were a lot of horse type, a lot of types of riding in St. Louis, saddle seat, you know, hunter jumper, whatever. They let me take riding lessons. And then when I, went to my sixth grade school there, they had a pony and lo and behold, I was on the pony committee. I think it was in, I think it was in March. Um, I was on the pony committee with an, another sixth grader who was very, very much more knowledgeable than I was. And we got there on Sunday morning to feed the pony and she had had a fall. Oh. And nobody at nobody in charge knew that she was pregnant so we were fascinated by the foal and it was great and then I have a question Jane sure my school did not have a pony committee so <laughs> what is the pony committee oh our job was to feed the pony okay. so we we did it during the day and then we did it after school we did it first thing in the first thing when we got there and then again at lunch and then after school um, before we went home. And then we had to come on Saturday and Sunday and make sure she was okay and, um, and also feed her on those days too. So she had a foal and did you get to take it home? <laughs> well, for some reason, no. Oh, it's not fair. What a shame. Yeah. But um, we did have a naming contest. I can't re remember the name that um, was chosen, but it was a big deal. And it, we, we were really crazy about the foal. And I don't know, I kept riding all through about 10th grade. And, um, and then I, saw, I, thought, I sort of thought that, well, those days are behind me. And I went off to college and I did other things. And then when I was in my 40s, I came back to it. And I realized I was still totally over the moon when I was on a horse. That's fantastic. So do you ride pretty much yeah. times a week or? Probably four or five times a week. Wow. And several of your books, including this one, involve racehorses. Were you ever involved in that part of the? I horse? was. How um, so? When I came back to riding and when I was 40, I guess I was 44. And the reason was that um, we had a summer house in Northern Wisconsin. And my son was about, I think he was about nine months old. Yeah, he was about nine. It was the summer after he was born. He was born in September. So he was about 10 months old. And they, there was one of those, I had heard that there was one of those people who sold toys, baby toys from her house. And so I was just driving around in the woods looking for her house. And I made the wrong turn and came to this barn that looked exactly like an upscale riding establishment in St. Louis. It just floored me. Mm -hmm. And so I had him and I got out of the car and I went and introduced myself to the owners. And I asked if I could take some lessons and they said, sure. And so I showed up the next day and they put me on this really tall, beautiful gray thoroughbred and um, I loved him. And the next day I showed up again for another lesson and I walked past his stall and he nickered at me and I thought, ah, oh, he loves me too. 
And that was, and so within, I think about two or three weeks, I bought him. And, and I did, we didn't, nobody knew what anything about him, but he did have a tattoo on the underside of his lip. And I knew that that's meant that he'd been a racehorse. So I wrote down the tattoo and I wrote off to the jockey club to find out, you know, anything about him. Well, it turned out that he had had 52 starts. He'd won something like $165,000. He'd been born in Germany. He'd raced in France in, in the wow. West Coast, on the East Coast. I mean, he was an incredibly sophisticated guy. And he was also a total sweetheart. And um, I, I was really crazy about him. And I thought, well, if this is what a racehorse is, I want some, I want to breed some. And so it was, it was probably a big mistake, but at the same time, it was a, it was a great pleasure. Okay, so as I said, this book um, starts with a, a racehorse who's actually, when the book opens, winning a race. And this is the perestroika of the title. Uh, we've got to start with the title because you hear the name of the book and you think, I don't want to read a political book. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. And I didn't, especially because I'm sorry to say what we were living through. Sure. It's not a political book. So talk about the horse's name. Well, her, her sire was a horse named Moscow Ballet. She's my horse, Perestroika. And, I, and when she was born, I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna- Excuse me, in real life, Perestroika. In real life, yeah. Okay. So because her sire was named Moscow Ballet, um, I decided to name her Perestroika. When I was first, and she's a fascinating horse and she's very curious and, and she's been a lot of fun to have. And so, when I first started writing the book so many years ago, I used her nickname, which was Paris, P-A-R-A-S, and I called it Paris in Paris. But the, I think it was, I can't remember which publisher it was, it might've been the English publisher, said that if it was called Paris in Paris, the readers would think it was about paratroopers in Paris. <laughs> so. So it was a dilemma. And I said, okay, let's just call it Perestroika in Paris. Okay. And um, that's how it got that name. And we hoped to get rid of all the, you know, political aspect by using, by just putting the animals and the Eiffel Tower and stuff on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. So th it is a book about Paris as well. And the most kind and gentle fairy tale Paris, but we'll get into that. In the beginning, <laughs> I said this book, um, or I, I believe I said this book is for adults and you've written a lot of books about horses for children. Mm -hmm. However, I could see this being a book for a good young adult reader, number one, and also a book parents could read to their younger children, because there's nothing in this book you wouldn't want a child to have access to. I mean, there's nothing. Right. Later. That's right. And um, it never occurred to me to, to make, to bring in a villain or, you know, I, I, my, my Hollywood um, agent said she wasn't going to show it to anybody in Hollywood because there was no bad guy. And I thought, oh. I want there to be a bad guy for these characters, including the animals life is the opposition it's it's making it through life that's the big deal and i just didn't i thought it was too trite to put a bad guy in so i couldn't put a bad guy in totally even the human beings are lovely in this book but let's introduce um our audience tonight to the characters and um, the main characters are all animals and they are anthropomorphized. They speak- Except the little boy, the little boy is- Well, the yes, there's a little boy with his 97 year old deaf grandmother, and there's a lovely baker and a produce man and a park gardener. And, but the, the, the animals have center stage mm -hmm. and the animals are, they speak and they feel some pretty complex emotions. So we have Perestroika who, or Paris, who at the beginning of the book, decides, is very curious, as Jane said, and decides to leave the race course and go out into the world. And Paris goes out into the city of Paris 
And the first friend she meets is Frida. And Frida is um, a dog, oddly enough, she's a short haired German pointer. Mm -hmm. and, and you had for many years such a dog, is that true? Yes, I, I based both Paris and Frida on my animals because I thought they were really interesting. Um, Frida was a very, Frida has, Frida now would be about 18 years old, but she's, she was a very beautiful, interesting dog. But when she, sometimes you'd look at her when she was lying on the, in her chair and she would look so depressed. And I thought, well, if it's, if it's a German short hair, she's got to have some existential problems of some kind, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was easy to write about her. She's an interesting dog. Um, I suppose if I really wanted a bad guy, I would have put our Jack Russell in. Oh, <laughs> well, as I told you, I got a rescue dog last March when I thought we were in for a long haul. And I have to take issue with you about something because <laughs> you would say in this book, um, dogs saw humans as friends, horses saw humans as co-workers. Mm -hmm. My dog sees me as a servant. <laughs> no question about it. And he's got a little Jack Russell in him, so. Well, I've had two Jack Russells and they were, to one was a female and one was a male and they were totally interesting and fascinating. And the female was like a mixture of dog and cat. She could climb a tree. She was a wonderful hunter. She um, she was as flexible as a dog could be, and it was she was a fascinating dog, and um, and the male was a little more irritable, but but he was quite he was quite a good dog too. So Frida, the dog in this book, serves as Paris's guide to the city of Paris, mm -hmm. and Paris is very innocent when he leaves the cloistered world of racing for their yeah. first. So tell us about Frida and, and what he serves in this novel and for Paris. Well, Frida, um, she had been owned by a very talented busking musician who played the guitar and was a great, was, was really, you have to say he was a loner. Mm -hmm. And Frida was probably his only friend and he'd had her since she was a puppy. And um, she had learned to, to always look very dignified and beautiful and in order to get money for him from the, from the people of Paris. Um, bef not long before this book begins, he has died and, um, and now she's alone in Paris. And she doesn't, Frida doesn't quite understand that her owner has died. She knows he's not there anymore. But well, she, she knows what it looked like. You know, she, she knows that they took him away, that he, that he was flat out on the ground and they took him away. Right. I'm not gonna say she knows exactly what death is, but she, um, she knows he's gone. But she also knows because he was a busker and he was always aware of how much he was making um, on any particular day. She also knows what money is. And so one of the things that she knows that Paris doesn't know is what money is and what money is for. And Paris has some money because when Paris leaves the racetrack after having won her, her race, she, and it's a jumping race. It's a, it's a over hurdles, low jumps. She, um, she saw that there was a purse lying on the ground and she'd heard all about purses and she knew she'd want a purse. So she figures that's her purse. So she takes it with her, but she doesn't know what it's for. She just knows it's a purse. It's Frida who has to um, show her that it's for buying provisions and Finance and, and, stuff. and I don't want to ruin this for people. I was just <laughs> about to describe it. And I thought, no, you have to discover this in the book because it's so delightful how Frida procures food for <laughs> not only Paris, 
but also there's a philosophical raven named Raul. <laughs> yeah. Another fabulous character and actually has some of the best lines in the book, I think. So tell us well, about Raul. He has a lot book. to say. I will say that Raul has a lot to say. Um, not all of it is about himself, but he's very aware of his status. Let's put it that way. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about him because again, um, the interplay between these animals, the innocent, uh, Frida's street smart, Raul um, waxes philosophical and has a kind of um, cynical edge. I mean, you must have had great fun writing this book. Well, I really did. And I, I did um, have to visit Paris. Let me say one thing. It is set um, on the west side of the Seine. So there's a steep hill. If, you, if you're standing at the Seine, you look up this steep hill and it's up that hill. And um, that's a really beautiful area uh, in Paris. And it's one of my favorite, it's just so, it's got so many beautiful spots and lovely buildings. And, and it's right across the river from the Champ de Mar, which is this huge park that was once a, a uh, cavalry training area for the, um, for, the, for the French army. Anyway, um, I, when I would go to those places and look around, I, I always noticed how many birds there were and how many ravens there were and how vocal they were. They were always cawing and flying and cawing. And I just thought, oh yeah, if there's gonna be a, an, a bird character, then it has to be a raven and he has to have a lot to say. Yeah, can you <laughs> just, you, you uh, described this section of Paris, but will you just name some of the landmarks there so people in our audience sure. who know Paris will be familiar? Well, the place where they all first meet is called the Place du Trocadero. Mm -hmm. And um, it's right by two big museums. And uh, I can't remember, one is the military museum, I think, and one is the uh, Musée Humain, I, as I remember. Um, and then those museums um, are standing above a big, park that sort of sweeps down to the Seine. And then right across the Seine from that area is the Eiffel Tower. And the Eiffel Tower is at, um, from that point of view, it's at the right hand corner of the Champ de Mar. And so the Champ de Mar is this beautiful big park. And then there's buildings uh, at the far end. And then on both on the left side and the right side, there are some beautiful houses and neighborhoods that have been there a, quite a long time. But also, you know, as in as as always in Paris, the residential districts are sprinkled with shops and shopping districts, and so um, it it's it was a good spot to set it was a good spot to set this book first of all because it's a beautiful spot and I love it but also because the animals needed to have some access to some provisions and some way of actually um, eating yes uh, so that so I had to pay attention to the practical issues too there's also um, a pair of squabbling mallards named oh, Sid and Nancy uh, <laughs> Those of you who are of an age will remember Sid Vicious and Nancy Spunge, <laughs> I think it was, yes. the Six Pistols. Uh, interesting relationship. And uh, Sid loves to fly south for the winter and Nancy just stays put, but they make it work. And <laughs> they're an interesting couple and they're sort of part of the menagerie. Mind you, this is an urban park. We're not out in the middle of nowhere, but as I said, the story has a fairy tale or a fable quality to it. So the fact that this menagerie can exist, a horse <laughs> with nobody on it or owning it in an urban park is just fabulous. It's just so much fun. I love that. Well, it does take place late in the winter. So, um, and the year it's set, which is 2008, they hadn't done a whole lot of um, up, what, 
I don't know if you'd call it upgrading, but they hadn't done a lot in that area for quite a long time. And so it was a little more natural and a little rougher than it is now. Um, and also, you know, it's Paris in the winter. Who right. wants to go out? It's cold, it's rainy, it's snowy, you know? There's all that good food. But <laughs> <laughs> give people a little taste of the book. I know you prepared something to read. So if you wouldn't mind setting it up for us and uh, give us a little taste of Perestroika in Paris. Well, I like to read from the very beginning because um, I don't want to give too much away. But I should say that the, book, the publisher did a wonderful job on this book. And um, inside the cover is a very good map of where it's taking place. So you don't have to be confused when you're reading it. Um, so I'll just read the first few pages. <clears throat> Paris had won her race. She had jumped all the jumps with a great deal of pleasure and she thought in excellent form. The number two horse, a chestnut gelding from down south somewhere, had been so far behind her that she hadn't been able to hear his hoofbeats on the turf. And of course the crowd was yelling too. She had, she thought, almost danced across the finish line. Everyone was happy. The jockey did a backflip off her, the groom gave her a kiss, and Delphine, her trainer, gave her a hug and three lumps of brown sugar, not to mention an excellent feed of carrots, and she was all cool and calm after the race. Since it was the last race of the day, and indeed the year, it was early November, the van, which, had already, which already had four horses, had left before her race began, so as to come back and get her. But now the van was late, the stable was empty, and Rania, her groom, had, she said, gone to the bathroom, and why not in the stall, thought Paris, but she could never get an answer to this question. Twilight was ascending over the vast green expanse of Otoy Racecourse. The jumps had dimmed into dark shapes against the still vivid green grass. Admiring this, Paris did something that she often did. She pressed against the door of the stall. This time, something happened that had never happened before. It swung open. After a moment, Paris stepped carefully out into the fine, crunchy gravel and snorted. Everything remained quiet. She could see now that every stall was empty and dark. In fact, the green of the race course was the brightest color around, so bright that for a moment, she didn't dare head out there. But Paris was a very curious filly. At her feet were several items that Rania had left behind. A grooming box full of brushes, Paris's blue blanket, and something that Paris knew was called a purse. This was the only thing that interested Paris. She had seen lots of purses, had heard even more about them. She had in fact just won a purse. And so she thought this would certainly be it. She dropped her nose, snuffled a bit and found the handle. She picked it up and trotted out of the stable yard onto the race course. Really, she thought, for a horse who had just run a long race and with 14 jumps, she felt quite full of beans. She kicked up her heels and gave a squeal. To begin with, Paris had no idea of making a getaway. Not only did she like racing and Delphine and Rania and her owner, Madeline, and several of the other horses, as well as her nice clean stall up there in Maison Lafitte, she really didn't know how know much else. None of the horses did. All had been born on pleasant farms in the country and all had come to Maison Lafitte when they were hardly more than babies and all had been galloping and eating and riding in the van and racing and galloping and eating and racing for quite a while, as long as Paris could clearly remember actually. It was an active life. And in Maison Lafitte, there was plenty to see of a morning, especially if you were raced over jumps. 
but the horses did talk among themselves about what else might be out there. Some worldly ones had traveled from down south or from across the sea, had seen different courses. They lorded it over the others a bit. There were also those who talked about escaping this life, but they never talked about what else they might do. Paris did not think that any of them were as curious as she was. And here was the grass. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Jane Smiley reading from Perestroika in Paris. And they weren't allowed to eat the grass. And boy, she eats that grass. And this <laughs> good stuff. This is really good stuff. Mm -hmm, it, yes, absolutely. Well, you have said, um, and this book bears it out, but I'd like to hear you talk about it, that horses sharpen people's empathy. How is that? Well, it, especially if you ride them, you have to learn to think like they do and see the world like they do, or they're going to get you off. Um, they have very distinct personalities and feelings about things. Um, even in my three horses that I have, I can see how different they are. Uh, in the very simplest way, one of them doesn't just hates the wind. And, the, and another one, one of the others couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, if you're mounted on a horse, you want to think how they're, they're thinking in order to understand what they might do or what they're about to do. And so you learn to pay attention and you learn to observe what, what, hurts what bothers them what doesn't bother them what they like to do what they don't like to do um what they're curious about what they're not curious about um paris my horse paris is a very curious filly and she's a, i can go for a walk with her and she's always looking here and looking there it's not that she's scared it's that she just wants to see um so that's always fascinated me. And since I bred a bunch of them, so they're related, it's fascinated me to see what characteristic, characteristics they share and what they don't. Um, I, I've had a lot of trainers, so it's been really interesting to me to see how they respond to various training um, styles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the old style way, used to, when I was growing up, the old style way was you just made them do what you they what you wanted them to do and that's not the way it is anymore now the trainers are much more adept at noticing what the horses seem to understand or not understand and getting the horses to cooperate rather than to obey isn't that a little bit the same with dog training these days? Where, I think so, yeah. So there's just more empathy for the animals mm -hmm. overall. Um, well, the, the theory of animals versus humans has really changed. You know, I don't think when we were growing up or when I was growing up that people thought very much about the temperament of an individual animal. Um, but now they do. Now they observe it and they pay attention to it. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. This is, this is a light book, um, at, as I said. But there is some really important stuff in this book, I think, um, about ownership and freedom and possessions. So you snuck some stuff in there that um, really makes you think. You know, well, good. I, I don't think I, people, I don't think writers can help it, you know, <laughs> because they're thinking. Right. And so they, um, they can't, they can't make it just, you know, fizz. It, there has to be some substance there too. Well, there's definitely substance. And as I mentioned, there also are some human characters, an eight-year-old boy who lives with his 97-year-old grandmother, uh, Jerome, the produce man, Anais, the baker, Pierre, who tends the gardens, all of them are kind and generous. And I know that you wrote this book before the pandemic. I assume you did. Oh, yeah. 
you wrote it during the last administration. So I'm wondering. Well, I started it in 2008. Oh, you did? So it's been going on for a long time. I, I, I've, I've written a bunch of other books sort of alongside it. But because I enjoyed writing it so much, I love to sort of come back with it and add to it and fiddle with it and stuff. So, so it wasn't in, in, in um, as a salve or a balm because of the craziness that was going on in this country. It was a project that predated all of that. Yes, it was just a, an act of pleasure for me yeah. um, to just yeah. keep doing it. And, and of course I had to go do a lot of research in Paris, so. Oh. That's too bad. And you didn't eat anything good or drink anything lovely. While oh, you not a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, here's a question or a comment from Kathleen, who says she loves the book. And it's just the right time for a hopeful read and wants to know if it was meant for young adults originally. No, it was meant for me. Um, and I, I have written, um, what is it, eight eight young adult books at this point. Um, but no, it was meant for my pleasure. And um, I thought that having the little boy, there's a kind of fairy tale esque aspect of having an eight year old boy, but I wanted to make him have practical issues that he has to deal with, with his great grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I. I'm glad that different types of different ages and different types of people have enjoyed it. Um, yeah. And I'm just glad of that. I hope that's continues. It's also a book about finding community, kind mm -hmm. of finding your family, because all of the animals and the humans and the little boy and his grandmother become a very mutually supportive community, which is kind of a beautiful thing. Unfortunately, they, the, the, the boy and the grandmother live in a very large and extremely antiquated house, so certain someones can come inside. Yes, yes. <laughs> that too is extremely charming. Well, I think um, I want to ask you a couple more questions before we go. And oh, look, look here. Um, Robin says, this book has a lot of similarities with Charlotte's Web, but I hadn't seen anyone who reviewed it mention that. Did you, Jane, see any similarities with that children's classic? Well, I have to say I haven't read Charlotte's Web since I was about 10. Oh, you have to. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I haven't gone back to it. I, I remember really enjoying it back then, but um, I, I can't say that I had reread it. So I, I don't know what similarities there are. Okay. Uh, we also have a um, audience member who says that Frida broke her heart a little bit. Oh, oh. well, Frida has a loneliness that, yes. we have, and she also knows that she has to look sort of prosperous and dignified because if she lets her guard down, she'll be sent to the, the pound or whatever. Yeah, and she doesn't know what, you know, her, her, her owner was extremely suspicious guy. And one of the things that the others who've seen him around town mention is they don't understand why he didn't have a regular music career because he was very talented. So she's known him since she was a puppy and now he's gone. And I think that's a real crisis for her. Absolutely. Um, Kathleen says she can't wait to read the book to her granddaughter when she's old enough. She's thinking maybe eight or 10. Does that sound right to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, two more things uh, and then we'll see if we have some more questions. One is you wanted me to ask you to tell us about your trip to Iceland and I'm doing what I was told. <laughs> well, this came up because we were talking about chocolate and I was, I was saying how much I loved Icelandic chocolate. It, it's got so much flavor and it's so good. And then it reminded me of when I was in Iceland back in the late seventies um, when I was there for a Fulbright. And we, I would walk into town, we could cook our own food in our dorm and I would walk into town and I'll never forget being in this supermarket 
and there was a woman be behind the butcher's counter and another woman talking to her. And on top of the counter, there was a, a, a plate with a stalk of celery on it. And the two of them looked at each other and, and the, the customer said, and which means what's that? And the butcher said, celery. And then the both of them just shrugged. They had never <laughs> seen it or heard of it. And oh. it <laughs> it always made me laugh to think about that. I loved Iceland. I, I thought it was fascinating. It gave me a real desire to write The Greenlanders, which is one of my favorite books of mine. Um, even though Greenland is quite different from Iceland, but still there's that, that sort of similar feeling. And so I had a wonderful time there. And um, I loved going back. They, had, they brought me back about almost two years ago now. Mm -hmm. And we had perfect Icelandic weather, snow, sleet, rain, sunshine, four different days in a row. That's, I can't <laughs> go if we ever fly again. Um, I am being admonished by an attendee. I forgot about the rats. Do you want to <gasps> say, oh my God, how could I? Would you say um, something? But they're supposed to be the, the pleasant surprise. Well, there are a lot of surprises. Um, so you can say as little about them as you would like. Well, they are Kurt and Conrad. Kurt is the young rat and Conrad is the old rat. And they live in the old lady's house. And um, they, they are very well fed because the old lady has lots and lots of provisions and they know just exactly how to get them. So, um, Kurt really, 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 really wants to find a female rat. And so that's, he's the one with the quest. And we'll let you discover the rest about the rats. Lois <laughs> says, a big thank you for a charming, wonderful book. I thoroughly enjoyed every aspect of it from the animal point of view to the tender understanding of the young boy and his great grandmother, loving Paris and Paris, P-A-R-A-S, makes it even better. Great. So that's a satisfied Thank customer, you. definitely. Thank you very much. And um, Jane, um, we were talking at the outset, um, well, before I ask you that question, everybody wants to know what you're working on now because a new Jane Smiley book is cause for celebration. So <laughs> what's in store for us? Well, talk about a bad guy. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, love, I live on the Monterey Peninsula and I love the peninsula. I love going to the various little towns and noticing how different they are. Um, but Monterey itself is a pretty historic place and it's very well kept up. So the, there's lots of beautiful buildings um, from the original era of the 1830s, 40s and 50s. And I thought, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set a murder mystery in 1850s Monterey. Oh, wow. Fantastic. And so I, I can't, turned it in to my editor um, a few weeks ago. It's and, done. Well, it's not done. I have to do a lot of stuff and I have to make sure the history is accurate, accurate and all of that. But um, it's, it's, we got all the way through the plot. Let's put it that way. Had you written a murder mystery before? I don't. I don't know if. Yes, you... I wrote one a long time ago called Duplicate Keys. Okay. That was my third book. Took place in New York, and I wrote it because I knew I wanted to write the Greenlanders, but I didn't know if I could figure out how to plot a book as as long as the Greenlanders. So I wrote a murder mystery to learn how to make a plot. And then I had, well, I was, I was still teaching at Iowa State at the time, and I had about four colleagues, and I would hand parts to them as I was going through that to see if they could figure out who had done it. And one of them did, so I knew I had to fix that. But um, so that's, I have written one murder mystery. Oh, I it's actually still in print, if you can believe that. I cannot wait. And remind me where you said it. You said, but I, my mind went blank. Where you set this murder mystery? The third, the first one, you mean? Or this the, new the, one? 
Oh, in 1860s. In 1850s, Monterey. Monterey. Okay. I can't wait for that. Um, one more, I keep saying one more thing and I'm clearly lying. You <laughs> casually mentioned your Fulbright and um, in Iceland. And I have to ask, I've always wondered, what do you actually do on a Fulbright? What do you do there? You learn the language, you go to classes, um, you learn the culture. Um, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Sounds uh, great. If you're in Iceland, you sleep a lot. <laughs> so you're not asked to produce a work of any kind. You're no, just... you're just asked to learn stuff. Wow. And it, it's, a, it's a great thing to do. And um, I just loved being there. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, you certainly, um, it's something you get because you're very accomplished. Oh, I see a couple more questions came in. Uh, Candace says, Dupli Duplicate Keys was a terrific murder mystery and the only one I've ever read that gave me chills. Oh, I read really? It recently, still chilling. Thank you. Wow. I'll add that to my list. Oh. And Deb asks, can Jane talk a little bit about her process? Does she outline a plot and write to the plot or does she start with an idea and see how it unfolds or some other process? Well, I do both of those things. Um, it depends on the book. So for example, I knew that a thousand acres, I knew that I wanted a thousand acres to adhere as closely as possible to the plot of King Lear. I didn't think there could be a war, but I didn't, I knew there could be a legal battle, you know. And so um, in that case, I knew what the plot was and I knew what I wanted to do. Um, when I, when I did the last hundred years trilogy, I knew when the children were born and I knew that all I had to do, and I knew that I wanted the years to go by in equal in an equal way rather than with the big events taking up more space than the smaller events and so i i basically followed the years looked up the history did did research on the history and then one thing i really tried to do in um the last hundred years was to investigate the idea of nature and nurture so i wanted to give the, I wanted to have the babies show up and be distinct from one another. And then to follow those distinctive qualities all through the lives of the characters. Um, let's see, what's another one? Um, well, uh, one of my favorites is the last, the, the All True Travels and Adventures of Liddy Newton. Mm -hmm. um, I got that idea because I was I was in Washington DC with my young daughter around the time of the Oklahoma bombing. Mm. And so I immediately went to the payphone and I called uh I we weren't married anymore but I called my uh, ex-husband and I said everything in Washington seems okay. It, it, it seems quiet here. I don't think anything bad's going to happen here. And I said, but I really need to write about this issue of con Amer conflict in America. Mm. I mean, really violent conflict. And he was a specialist in American history. And the first words out of his mouth were Kansas. First word out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And so then I went and I had no idea what I was going to do with my girl, Liddy, but I went to Kansas, I did the research, and then I put together that book. Um, and I, I'm, I'm still very fond of that book. Mm -hmm. Really. Uh, one more question from an attendee who wants to know, what were the books you wrote while you were playing with this book? You mentioned that you- Oh, had been, yeah. Well, um, so I put, I started thinking and writing this book in 2009. I was finishing up Private Life, which was published in 2010. <coughs> Excuse me. I was writing the um, 
the young adult horse books. So the, so the first one was published in 2009 and there were five of those. So that's the Georges and the Jewels, a good horse. Um, uh, can't even remember it, the names of all of them anymore. And then um, because I just adored this one character who was younger in the Georges and the Jewels, her name was Ellen and she was contrary. And I just remembered, you know, what it was like when I was young to watch the contrary girls. They were much more interesting than the good girls. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to write three more slightly younger age books for about Ellen, the contrary girl. Mm -hmm. And then also in the meantime, I was writing um, the, the Last Hundred Years trilogy. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are lots of projects going on. Sounds like you um, are a busy woman. I, uh, again, before the program, we were having a little conversation about independent bookstores and I know that you care deeply. Mm -hmm as do I think all of the authors we've, we've had on this series without exception. So can you share your thoughts with us, please? Well, you know, I grew up in St. Louis. I grew up loving bookstores. Um, the first one that I really adored was in Iowa City. Uh, it was Prairie Lights. And I just loved wandering around Prairie Lights and, and looking at the books and going to the readings that they sponsored. It was a great, it was a great thing to have in Iowa City was Prairie Lights. And since then I've always liked, we have a couple of good independent bookstores on the Monterey Peninsula. And um, I think they're a real asset for the community because you don't just go there to buy books. You also go there to sort of chat and see other people and, um, I think they're great. I love them. Thank you. Jane Smiley, what an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. Thank you for the time. The book, the new book, the wonderful book, I urge you all to buy it at Copperfields is Perestroika in Paris. And thanks to all of you for being with us here tonight. Everybody have a wonderful evening and stay safe. Yes, thank you for thanking you for joining us. I really appreciate it. And as always, you will receive an email tomorrow with um, a link to rewatch this video, as well as details for how to get the book plates and the books. So if you heard nothing more, just watch out for your email tomorrow. And thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Jane. It was lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.